Good morning readers, it's Tilly here from Tilly Shelf and welcome to another bookish breakfast. So last week I didn't really have a um, bookish breakfast because I had a little rant about politics and yes, results were not as hoped but we can move on from that and try not to um, think too pessimistically about the next five years. So um, I'm going to go back to the normal um, and just talk about the books that I've been reading this week. Um, so I should be asleep now because I'm on night shifts um, and I was planning on to have a nice lie-in until like 10 or 11 o'clock because I'm starting nights from tonight for four nights. Um, but I woke up at half past six when Bo got out of bed and I started thinking about the deathbed tag that I have been seeing a couple of people doing recently. It was created by Jason at Old Blue's Chapter and Verse and Lukash at Totally Pretentious and I've seen um, just a couple of really moving um, versions of that tag and I'm hoping to make my own maybe later on today possibly I won't have time or um, energy because I think it takes quite a lot of energy to think about that tag properly um, but at some point I will be making my own um, approach to that tag um, and it was just really on my mind and it really like I couldn't get back to sleep because I was thinking it through um, and thinking about how people had responded to it um, so I decided to get up and make the best of it um, and I'll try and have a nap later on today so the books that I've got to talk about today, uh, this morning, are nowhere near as like serious as the deathbed tag topics. Um, there's quite a high, like I guess, fantasy prevalence here, um, but anyway, let's go with it. So I finished listening to The Handmaid's Tale on Audible, um, and that was just a really, really good experience. Um, the narrator I thought had a really nice um, voice for the story. I found that I felt like she was speaking from the voice of the character, um, which made made a big difference to me. I feel like um, the narrator is quite important. Um, and I, I just really love the atmosphere of this book and the way that it tells such a powerful story without really any major events. It's very... Um, limited in scope and that limitation itself like lends to the claustrophobic atmosphere um, of the idea of this state where everything is um, controlled or attempted to be controlled um, and everything is is set in rigid patterns and the way that she describes all of the the rituals and things I find it a very very um, credible um, interpretation of a potential um, dystopian state. I wouldn't say that I see it as likely but I see the way that she um, writes about her, their justifications and their methods and so on as being um, ones that individually all seem to to work to make sense. So um, I really enjoy this book and, and re-listening to it um, confirmed me in my I placed Margaret Atwood amongst my favourite writers um, and re-listening to this story confirmed me in that 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 was the right um, that she was one of the right people to pick um, I'm now hoping to watch the series eventually um, this picture is the actress from the series um, just for curiosity and to see how they interpreted it because I know they changed some things but sometimes um, I've become a little bit more flexible on changing things and adaptations recently because sometimes I think it is nice to um, adapt, some, adapt something to suit the period in which you are adapting it, um, if that made sense. Um, so I think they, they fitted it to a 21st century context um, and I can see that working quite well. Um, yeah, my, my criticism is that it's too short. I wanted more from this character, um, so I guess I'm just going to have to read the testaments. I'm not sure if that's from the same character, but I know it's in the same world, so um, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on that eventually at some point. Um, so that was The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Um, then to replace that, I was thinking of avoiding starting a new audiobook because I'm supposed to be revising quite hard from now until January for my exams and I was thinking, oh, instead of listening to an audiobook, I'm just going to be listening to my um, lectures because there's audio recordings of all of the lectures. Um, but unfortunately, those are all online and it doesn't seem to be possible to download them. So when I'm not um, physically like in a Wi-Fi area, um, I can't really listen to them. So while I'm walking to and from um, the bus stop and so on, um, I kind of need another audiobook. So I picked another one that um, Bo has listened to previously because I think I've mentioned before I'm using his um, Audible account so I have to listen to um, books that he's picked. And that is Mortal Engines by Philip Reeve. And this is another reread for me. I read this probably when it first came out. When did it first came out? Come out. Um, 2002. 
Yeah, possibly um, around about when it first came out. Um, and all of my family read it and I hated it. And my mum, my dad and my brother all loved it and raved about it and couldn't understand why I didn't like it. Um, and Bo was pretty indifferent to it actually. He said he could see reasons for disliking it, but he enjoyed it enough to go on to finish the series. Um, so I thought I'd give it another go. Um, and there's been a film of it that's come out this year, so um, I thought if I read the book, I've heard that the film is really, really bad, um, but I like like big films with big like fantasy elements. So um, if I enjoy it, I think I will probably watch the film. So far, I think I'm about five chapters in um, and I'm not overwhelmed. I just find the writing a little bit clunky and predictable and the characterization and stories so far have given me nothing to really latch on to. It's an innovative vision of a future world but like I said The Handmaid's Tale was credible like I could believe that a world like that could exist. I really can't believe in this world um, and it's supposed to be this vision of the world far into the future. Um, I would rather if they just invented it as a completely new and set it as a fantasy world I think I would find it more believable than pretending that our world in the future would have this this situation where um, basically all of the cities are put onto wheels and ride around this giant continent eating each other. Um, I just really struggle to accept that. And I know it's, it's a fantas fantastical story. You're supposed to just like take certain things um, as, as part of the world, um, but because they're kind of pretending to base it on science, I just struggle with it a little bit more. So that's Mortal Engines by Philip Reeve, um, and hopefully it, it picks up a little bit. Then on paper, I have been continuing to read Vita Nostra um, by, um, I w both told me that I absolutely murdered their names um, last time, and I know that I did, um, but it's Marina and Sergei Jakenko, <laughs> something like that, I'll show you, um, who are two Ukrainian authors, and this is a fantasy story although so far um nothing in it is too fantastical like, again it's quite like it's it's weird but nothing stretches your belief too far almost um it's like is this coincidence or is this something um more sinister um and i'm really enjoying it the trouble is it's very very hard to put down once i pick it up so i'm not picking it up because I know that I can't afford to put that much time into reading. I think if I pick this up when I, I read it on the bus, um, and if I pick this up when I wasn't on the bus, I would probably finish it in one or two sittings. Um, and that would be like a whole day of revision gone because it's relatively chunky. Um, it doesn't have any chapter dividers. So, oh, maybe it's got a couple of part dividers. I haven't hit one yet. Um, um, yeah, and I can't, I can't lose that much time. <laughs> um, Bo's really bad for always making me read books um, just before I've got exams. So just before I think my second year nursing um, exams, he gave me, um, I can't remember what it's called now, um, The Final Empire to read and I read that whole trilogy like in the space of a week and didn't do any revision, but I still managed to get through those exams. So, so maybe I should just relax and let myself read this, but I feel like the, these exams are gonna be slightly different because they're at a slightly higher um, level. Um, so anyway, that's Vita Nostra, and I'm definitely still enjoying it, and I would still recommend it for um, any sort of young adult reader. Um, by young adult then, I didn't mean like young adult as the, the category of t in terms of like YA books, but I meant like I would recommend it to a young adult who is in the process of leaving home and like still having issues of like being a bit homesick, wanting to talk to their parents, but also wanting to like fit in with a peer group and like kind of work out issues around that um, and also wanting to like um, develop their um, knowledge and future career. Um, so yeah, I think it's an interesting book. Then a couple of weeks ago I did say that I was going to try to read an article every week. So last time I was on night shifts I had a night where I pretty much had to sit in a room for a little while. Um, so I thought I would um, read some a reader paper to just pass the time um possibly i shouldn't say things like that but you know i don't i don't know when you, you've just got to sit in a room and there's nothing like cares wise that you can do um i feel like this is the best way of keeping yourself awake really on a night shift um so this i can't remember i didn't write down the exact title um but it was an 
article about middle income countries graduating from health aid. It was published in 2019 by an author called Yame et al. Um, so I'm sorry that I didn't write down the full title, um, but it was the middle of the night, so that's my excuse for everything, really. Um, so this was not a research article, and I think from now on I'm going to try to stick to research articles, because although this was interesting, I felt like it was more just kind of speculation and discussion of things that I already kind of knew, um, but just putting their own names on it. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't find it quite so interesting as the Nutrition in Guatemala one that I read recently. Um, and basically this article um, talks about the fact that now, at the present moment in time, ap approximately 70% of the people living in extreme poverty in the world live in middle income countries rather than lower income countries. Um, and it talks about the, the, the need for a kind of a global health transition in that when a country is in a state where it is a middle income country, it no longer kind of qualifies for a lot of the um, global aid funds um, and a lot of donors um, move towards like going out of that country and leaving that country to manage by itself um, and there's sort of inherent problems with that. Um, so Yame and his co-authors created this idea of the four D's of global health transition. So two of those are about like condition shifting, so there's diseases and demography, um, dem demography, dem demography, I think. Um, so diseases wise, there is still a high prevalence of communicable, communicable, <laughs> communicable diseases, so infectious diseases, the typical um, diseases that you expect to hear about in um, countries that are struggling with the health systems in terms of malaria, TB, HIV. Um, but also an increasing burden of non-communicable diseases like the ones that we recognise like diabetes and um, heart disease that are more familiar from um, a higher income country's health system where infectious diseases are less of a problem um, and also higher numbers of injuries so I think we have this idea like I know so many people who've gone to um, I don't know, like Thailand, and they've got on a motorbike and they've driven around Thailand and had an amazing time and been like, oh yeah, there's no road laws, but everyone's fine. Um, everyone is not fine. Um, a lot of countries have um, a very high burden of injury, particularly road traffic related injuries, because they don't have the laws that in higher income countries we kind of take for granted, um, and the, the kind of road systems and the the quality of roads, traffic lights and so on um, that we accept as normal um, but they have an increasing number of people who are able to access um, motor vehicles or increasing numbers of people um, who might be like living close to roads in terms of moving into cities um, so there's like increasing exposure to injury um, and there's also injuries from conflict as well like a legacy of um, injuries from that um, and they these middle income countries are continuing to have a high burden of maternal and child um, illnesses and conditions. Um, so what you get in the end of that is like a double burden of disease. So you've got the, the kind of like diseases of privilege almost like um, it, that, I mean that's a difficult term to use because it, it doesn't tend to be the people who are the best off that are affected by um, something like diabetes. Um, but also the diseases that are related to maybe a tropical area um, and so on. So yeah, diseases changes. Demography is also changing because there has been a huge amount of work put into reducing um, under five mortality, so mortality in the youngest children, with variable success. But there has been a huge amount of progress in that. Um, and there has been a reduction as well in maternal mortality in a lot of settings. Um, but there hasn't been a corresponding reduction in fertility in all cases. So what you have is what they have called the youth bulge. So more adolescents, basically. Um, but also an aging population as people start to be healthier, they start to live for longer. Um, so then you get like a double uh, demographic challenge because you're working age adults are less, so the people who are paying into the system um, become less. Um, and then they talk on the other side to that, um, the kind of more artificial shocks to the system in terms of um, development assistance and like I mentioned um, donors who might be withdrawing from the system because they see the country as having like above a certain GDP or whatever whatever threshold they set and saying oh well you know you're well off enough to take care of your own hospital so we are going to leave and it's about how that process is managed and whether it's done adequately um, and also domestic health finance, financing is the final D um, and that's about like how a government chooses to, to divide their money I suppose and, and how they um, support their own hospitals and primary healthcare systems. Um, so yeah, so it was pretty interesting. Um, 
I just thought some of you might be interested to hear the countries that are like the next um, cohort, I suppose, that are going to be reaching a, above a certain threshold um, to be able to like be kind of left to their own devices. Um, because I was quite surprised by some of these. Um, so Angola, I read a lot about that in the book that I read recently, um, Band-Aid for a Broken Leg by Damien Brown, which was an MSF doctor. He spent a lot of time working in Angola and it didn't sound like the kind of health system that would cope very well um, without, at the time it was quite heavily supported by MSF, but that was in 2012, so things may have changed quite a lot. Um, Cameroon, um, the Congo, Congo Brazzaville, I just wrote Congo B, um, Moldova, Mongolia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Sudan and Timor-Leste. And amongst these countries, there are some countries that still have a very high burden of maternal mortality, countries that are even known for having a very high burden of, of um, maternal mortality, like the Congo, um, and that have a lot of like um, challenges in terms of um, health financing as well. So um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, and it will be quite interesting to see how countries are able to respond to these changes and w where where things go in the future and, and hopefully that things will continue to get better um, in terms of like um, infectious diseases and maternal and child mortality um, but it's quite a big thing to, to, to deal with um, like a whole health system yeah it would be a big thing to deal with um, so it, it's interesting and like how it's going to impact on progress towards like the sustainable development goals and the goals that we as a world have set to say oh we would like these things to be better um but then also if we're like withdrawing from certain countries i say we like i have any kind of say on this but if um like global donors are withdrawing from certain countries or stepping back um how that is going to impact on um the ability to meet people's needs when so many people who are affected by poverty live within countries that are becoming more well off as a whole um when there's a lot of inequality within countries so anyway, I hope that made some sense. It was a little bit interesting because you you you, you seem to say that that articles were interesting. So I, I liked that that people seemed interested. Um, and then the final book that I read. Um, this was a completely unintentional um, read. Like I'm trying to not buy books generally, but um, my um, school is very close to. Um, uh, a mass of water stones, sorry, I just got distracted by a seagull flying across the window. Um, my school is quite close to a mass of water stones. I've been spending a lot of time in water stones um, buying Christmas presents, basically. So I was thinking about the Bougie booktuber tag. Um, and there's one of the questions on that, which is like, what's the most amount of money you've ever spent in a bookshop? And for me, I think it's definitely this year in water stones because um, almost everyone is getting a book for Christmas. Like, d sorry for, you know, spoiling for anyone um, what to expect, um, because I just, I love being in there. Um, and anyway, this book caught my eye, um, and it is A Year Off, a story about travelling the world and how to make it happen for you by Alexandra and David Brown. And at first I was, I completely dismissed it and I didn't think that I would possibly buy it, but then it just kept catching my eye again and again, and I kept opening it and looking at the really nice pictures. Um, and it came at a time when, oh, I'm just not managing to find any pictures, am I? Um, I've already mentioned that Bo and I are getting married, we're thinking about our honeymoon, we would like to go to New Zealand, but it came at a time when we were thinking, um, like, financially, could we afford to go for maybe slightly longer than we had originally planned? Could we um, afford to maybe do a little bit more than we were originally thinking of doing and I definitely don't think we would be going anywhere for a year just purely for logistical um, reasons um, but it just it just really ah, it tempted me it tempted me with its beautiful pictures and so I committed the cardinal sin of buying myself a present just before Christmas um, rather than putting it on a list because I was embarrassed to put such a trivial book on a on a Christmas like as a Christmas present request um, and I thought I would dip in and out of it over the course of like the next year as we're um, sort of making plans um, but I, in the end I just found it really interesting because it's such a it's full of like little bits of inspiration of I want to go away, I want to go away and that just drew me in um, so I have read all of it now. Um, I would say the best parts of this book are where they are um, giving practical tips and practical um, tips is the best word really I don't know why I'm trying to think of a synonym for it um, 
for like how to plan a route, how to pack lightly um, and things like that. And the worst parts of it are when they were just kind of doing a little bit of writing about their own trip because the things that would be important to me and to Bo if we were to go on a longer trip are very much not the things that are important to Alexander and David. So they talked um, very emotively and beautifully about going to, for instance, see um, a mass read by the Pope. That is not something that would really be of any interest to me. I would love to go to, um, I've forgotten, is it called the Basilica? <laughs> Um, to that kind of, to, to like a religious site, but just to admire the, the kind of the architecture and the building and the artwork and so on. Um, and I wouldn't be interested in sitting through a sermon. Um, and like, it, it, it went on in a theme through the book that, that those were the things that they valued and they wouldn't be the things that I would value, whereas I would value um, maybe spending more time in beautiful like nature reserves and nature, nature sites, um, sites of natural beauty, um, rather than the things that they focused on. Um, but it was interesting and, and definitely having an account of their trip made me think about what I would value for myself um, and what we would value as a couple if we were to go away. Um, I found this interesting because they were travelling as a couple in their, I think, their late 20s um, slash early 30s, so it was more relevant than maybe some of the other books that were in the similar travel section. So anyway, I am glad that I got this. Um, and I did find it an enjoyable read and I will still be keeping it and looking in um, and looking back at the tips as well um, if we do end up going away. The one thing that really got on my nerves is there's all of these wonderful pictures but there's no caption to the pictures as to where they were taken. Um, there is at the back um, a kind of like an index of photographs but I just don't see the call for putting it at the back when you could very very easily, excuse me, very very easily put it on the pages where where the picture are where the pictures are um yeah i just i really don't see because the best part of this book to be honest was the pictures um and it was really irritating that you couldn't see where they were taken a lot of the time anyway thank you very much for watching i hope this hasn't been too dull and uh, i hope you're having a lovely day and i'll probably see you again before next thursday which will be boxing day that's a very weird thought um possibly for the deathbed tax so take care and have a nice week Bye.